The VGNM is an acronym that stands for Victoria Gallery and Museum, but for the purposes of this video it stands for Valentine's Greetings and Memories. Our Victoria building love stories begin in the 1880s with a beautiful illuminated manuscript that was presented to Principal Gerald Henry Rendell and his new wife on the 22nd of April 1887. Rendell was the first principal of University College Liverpool and had a lot of input into the design of the newly proposed Victoria building. In fact, it was only a month before this manuscript was presented to the newly married couple that plans had been set in motion for the Victoria building's construction to commemorate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Accompanying the manuscript was also an illuminated verse and a bouquet of flowers for Mrs Rendell, but only the typescript survives today. The verse from the students stated the following. Ever for good, we pray that in fair companionship mated, you, down time's swift stream gliding through sunshine and shade, may in each other find comfort and solace, and ever may flowers bloom on the bank and seem sweet, life ever yield you some joy. Aside from the felicitations of the new marriage, it is clear that there was a lot of love from the students for their principal, as the manuscript also states that he had shown a kindly interest in all students, and that they would forever remember him with gratitude. A few years later, in 1901, the students also celebrated the marriage of Professor Boyce with two cartoons in the Sphinx magazine. The first shows a fake heraldic crest, celebrating the match between the happy couple, including a wedding ring inscribed with their wedding date, and the caption underneath Cupid stating that he was smiling triumphantly at the success of his ultimate shot. The other image shows a joke stained glass window to be added to the Thompson Yates laboratory where the professor was based. The image portrays the end of the professor's bachelorhood stating, a wonderful year in Latin followed by the caption, in loving memory of Rupert Boyce, who departed bachelor life on the 9th of January 1901. Peace be with you. We also know that the two figures on the outside of the Thompson Yates building are classified representations of physiology and pathology, and are said to be modelled on Mrs Sherrington and our Mrs Boyce from the student magazine cartoons. And so, the marriages and love stories for the staff at the university were sometimes immortalised forever in the architecture of the campus buildings. But what of the students themselves? Did they ever find love at the university? When reading the Sphinx student magazine from the 1890s, it does seem to suggest that love was in the air, as there were many adverts for engagement ring purchases. Things were a little different for the first students at the University College Liverpool than they are today. Although classrooms permitted the sexes to mix under the supervision of the professors, the study spaces and common rooms for male and female students were separate. The corridor and balcony, however, were classed as common ground, and in one account from the 1900s, a student described how the architecture of the balcony was surprisingly convenient for private conversation with a potential love interest, and led to a term known as balconising. This was an activity whereby a male student would converse with a female student, separated by one of the many balcony rails or staircase banisters, so that there was some form of barrier of decorum between the couple. Although we don't have many photographs dating back to the early days, we do have two photographs from 1895 in the student magazine that show the Arts Lecture Theatre in the Victoria Building. Annual student soirees were opportunities for both sexes to mix, get dressed up and have fun in the building, and they were considered the annual event of the social calendar. Student plays were a common occurrence at the soiree, and these Valentine's Heart themed photographs show the student performers dressed as the Knave, King and Queen of Hearts during a very popular soiree evening. A little rhyme at the end of the article hints that the female performers may have stolen a few hearts amongst the audience. 
Oh, a merry, merry knave was the knave of hearts, and a merry, merry knave was he, and bold was the king, and he knew how to swing his sceptre right royally. But the maidens fair, who played their parts, of the various queens and the various carts, stole something more than three or four little bits of fine pastry, for they ran away with all our hearts, which was more of a theft, do you see? The article states that the queens were young and fair, and attended by maidens of honour, selected for by their beauty, and so we can assume that the writer of this article may have had his heart stolen by several of the female performers. We can only surmise that this article and poem had its desired effect, and a few love matches were made after this performance. The Student Magazine was also a place for light-hearted criticism. In 1907, a student article announced that there had been two marriages of junior staff within one year, and this abnormally high rate of marriage within the faculty was proof that they were being overpaid. In 1908, we can see a few illustrations in the magazine after one of the student soirees, and one of the lectures available to the students was apparently on matchmaking. If the drawing is to be believed, as a female student in 1908, you had to be dressed up in an authentic Dutch costume and be serving drinks to make a match with one of the male students. Elsie Neal was an English student from 1912 to 1916 and recalled that the gallery around the hall was at all times common ground and that the niche framed by the ceiling, two columns and a balustrade was a surprisingly convenient place for private conversation. The wide staircases in the building also provided meeting places for students to talk together. Edna Rideout studied modern history between 1912 and 1915 and stated that a man came up from Victoria Hall and conversed with a woman leaning on a balcony rail at the foot of the stairs of the Tate. It was scandal making and not done by the best people. However, in 1913, in the student songbook, a popular Italian song was given an English translation and repeated these words. If I meet you on the balcony, Please, will you cast a glance my way? Kindly glance this way. This shows it must have been something that was fairly popular amongst the students around this time to make it into the university songbook. William and Margaret Killen met whilst at university a little later in the 1920s and William stated that they both fondly remembered the balcony in the Victoria building, where they had many an interesting chat. They later married in 1935 and became teachers, and so the balcony in the Victoria building may have brought together quite a few couples in its time. Edna Rideout also had an account for where the female students left their belongings during their lectures in 1912, and she stated the following. Our cloakroom was a balcony rail, which was always draped with our coats and mackintoshes and hats, and every woman student wore a hat. These hats tended to slide down into the Victoria Hall, then not a thoroughfare, but the stamping ground for the men's students. When a hat fell, some man during a temporary absence from Victoria Hall of Parrington, the head porter, would pick it up scale a life-size statue of Christopher Bushell that stood in the hall on a high plinth and place the hat on its head, where it remained until the owner could persuade Parrington to fetch his stepladder and rescue it. Perhaps this was another way for the gentlemen to persuade the ladies to stay for a chat while their hat was being retrieved. We know that in 1898, during a student soiree, some very early telephone messages were exchanged rather unsuccessfully from the porter's office on the ground floor to the other end of the entrance hall. And later in 1913, an entry into the student's magazine suggested that students were looking at technology and telephones as a new way to communicate with one another in this area of the building. The Sphinx Oracle responded with the following answer. Too original. Your idea of a telephone from the balcony to the bushel is unworkable, we fear. Besides, the hall porter's duties as postman would be at an end, and we're afraid they'd miss the exercise. 
So it seems that although letters were a common way for the students to communicate privately with one another, from the women's first floor balcony to the men's common room directly below, they were also wanting to use modern technology to take their communication to the next level. Some students even tried to flirt in the library, as William Garman Jones, who became the university librarian in the late 1920s, recalled the following anecdote. In my student days, in the early 1900s, I was having a little flirtation in one of the niches of the Tate, when the university librarian, Sampson, appeared like an avenging angel and drove me out of my paradise. Sadly, that particular avenging angel was not linked with Cupid on this occasion, and instead Samson, who by all accounts was a formidable character, tried to put a stop to romance in the library. However, the student magazine once again also shed some light on more romantic liaisons in the Tate Library that might have slipped his notice. In answer to student correspondence and previous articles, the Sphinx Oracle answered the following. Yes, he certainly did say, suppose any of us marry. Thoughts of that nature frequently come out of the Tatar Tate and the Gossage. This is a play on words, replacing the word tete-a-tete -tete or private conversation between two people. We can therefore surmise it must have been a common occurrence for students in the Tate Library and Gossage Laboratories to have private conversations, which ultimately led to marriage proposals. In fact, the student magazine did advertise the best place to buy engagement rings, and in 1904, the student soiree included a popular theatrical performance for the Pride and Prejudice proposal scene, showing that love, marriage and engagements were a popular topic amongst the students. Another answer to a correspondent stated that it was not usual for students to kiss young ladies in the library, however very occasionally art students like to offend in this direction. So it appears that literature and love went hand in hand amongst the hidden niches and alcoves of the Tate Library. It seems that not all of the romantic liaisons in the Victoria Building ended in successful love stories. In 1913, a student comedy called The Love Episode of Miss Binks and Mr Jinks plays out within the walls of the Victoria Building, using the Tate Library, the student common rooms and the Arts Lecture Theatre as its setting. The story even includes a cameo appearance by the Knave of Diamonds, which echoes back to the performance 15 years earlier in 1898 with the Knave of Hearts from the student play. It appears that this may have been a real situation that happened between two students, which was then dramatised and made into a performance for the student panto night. The original story alludes to a shy male student trying to offer to sharpen a female student's pencil in the library and then being ridiculed by her friend, and gossip was spread around the common room and the poor mortified student could never show his face again. The panto performance, however, is a little bit more exaggerated and suggestive, with the character names changed to Miss Minx and Mr Winks, who find themselves alone in the alcoves of the Tate Library, with a much happier ending as they fall madly in love at the end of the story. It wasn't just the shy Tate reader who had hard luck with the ladies. Another student in the men's reading room, known for his curt replies, was called upon for his assistance and upon hearing it was one of the female students, became a lot more animated and eager to assist, only to find it was merely to carry some chairs to the arts lecture theatre rather than a romantic dalliance. Much to his disappointment, but to the amusement of everybody else, so much so it was written in the student magazine. The Sphinx Oracle in the student magazine also offered relationship advice, stating the following words of wisdom to a shy male student. Diffident. We sympathise, but you must overcome your shyness. Take a personal interest in your partner and she will be flattered. You might begin by asking her age and her first name, also the number of maiden aunts, her size in shoes and her favourite type of pickles. Other topics will no doubt suggest themselves as they proceed. 
with reference to the popular Valentine's poem, Roses are red and violets are blue. The student magazine also advised that if a male student wanted to express their grand passion, they should leave violets in their love interest locker because this was the most popular thing to do amongst the students. In February 1904, a female student describes an American Valentine's Day, presumably while studying abroad. The Valentine's Day invitation seems to be a very early type of speed dating, whereby a gentleman would talk to the ladies whose names were on his card, and had five minutes in which to propose marriage successfully, whereas the women would have to prevent the proposal, and whichever of the two was successful before the bell rang would win a gold paper heart. Prizes were given to whoever was the most successful, and the English author states that in England St Valentine's Day was not celebrated, and seems to feel that the whole thing was quite improper. The American host reminded the ladies that next year was a leap year, and so the ladies would be allowed to do the proposing, and the author happily concludes that she is back in England the following year and safely away from it and so it appears that some of the female students at the university did not appreciate Valentine's Day. Ever hopeful, however, a male student submitted a love poem in February 1908 called Of the Season, presumably for a fellow female student who would be reading the magazine over Valentine's Day, but perhaps she, like the previous lady, had no interest in her male suitor. We never do find out whether there was a love match for this suitor, but we do know that many marriages took place between former students, as they were celebrated in each issue of the student magazine. We know that another pair of students met in the Victoria building just shortly before the Second World War, as they became students in the Faculty of Art in 1938 and met by the War Memorial on the ground floor before and after their lectures. Leslie Randall Cottrell and Priscilla Rofe were in the same group of friends whilst at university and although war separated them for a number of years and they were not able to complete their studies until after the war had ended, they married in 1945 and graduated a few years later. A very fitting anecdote for Valentine's Day comes from Maurice Brodie and his partner with the appropriate name of Miss Love who were at university during the 1940s and 50s. As undergraduates, they'd studied German in the Victoria building, and after returning from America during his postgraduate year, he met his professor in the Victoria building, who inquired with some embarrassment as to whether Mr Brodie was now married and whether it was to Miss Love. Brodie said that yes, he was married to Miss Love, and it later dawned on him, after witnessing his professor's glee, that their romance as undergraduates had been the topic of conversation and gossip amongst the teachers in the Victoria building for many years. Even today, the love stories continue as many weddings now take place in the building. The first wedding at the Victoria Gallery and Museum was on the 15th of October 2010 between Victoria and Sam and many wedding couples who either studied, worked or met at the university have chosen us as their wedding venue. Victoria and Sam met while Victoria was studying at the university and after she graduated they moved to Newcastle but they never forgot their time in Liverpool. They chose the VGM as it was special to them both and Sam said that they fell in love with the VGM from the first time they visited. They loved the gothic architecture, spectacular interiors and the quirky museum and after the wedding ceremony in the Leggett, the couple relived all of their university memories while drinking a celebratory glass of bubbly in the museum. Gay and Vince chose to get married at the VGM on their 25th anniversary of being together. For them, there was no contest of where to have their wedding, as they were also Liverpool University alumni, as well as artists and educators who'd brought their students to the VGM over the years and had a strong connection to the building. Lisa and Andrew also chose the VGM for its character and quirkiness and it was special to them because they'd been here on a few dates for exhibitions and events and Lisa works at the university too. They made their wedding ceremony romantic with candles and flowers and had the perfect opportunity to take lots of photos on their special day. 
Many couples choose the VGM because of its stunning architecture and very little needs to be done in ways of decoration to create a special wedding day as Alex and Lauren discovered planning their wedding from abroad 2,000 miles away from the venue. They had many photographs taken in the Victoria building balconies and staircases where many other young couples had met over a hundred years earlier when they were balconising. The wedding ceremonies in the lecture theatre and the wedding breakfast and disco in the grand entrance hall are also reminiscent of the many soirees, performances and dances where couples met at various celebrations from the 1890s. Dancing near the war memorial where Leslie and Priscilla met in the 1930s, having drinks reception in the Tate Hall Museum echoing the romantic tales from the previous library setting amongst the niches and alcoves. So it appears that many love stories were started within our red brick university walls and stories of love and romance continue in the Victoria building today. Do you have a VGM love story that you'd like to share with us? Please do let us know, we'd love to hear them. Happy Valentine's Day from the Victoria Gallery and Museum. <laughs>